Hello friends, and welcome to my new video, in which I'll tell you some amazing stories. But before we begin, please subscribe to my channel and hit the like button on this video. Also, don't forget to write your thoughts about these stories down in the comments. Let's get started. The first story is, HOA blocks my access to the lake and claims they own my private pier. A nice old lady told me her story about the local HOA over a cup of coffee. She often invites me to spend time with her because she's very bored alone. I live near her and consider her my friend. She's not a part of the HOA, but the HOA really wants her to become part of them. Maybe she would agree to become a member, but she simply does not have the money to pay these fees every month. Although, compared to other HOAs, here is still somewhat reasonable, something like $300 a month, but it's still a lot for a retired person who lives alone. There was a certain fashion in this HOA to persuade people to become part of their HOA at any cost. More than one generation of managers has changed, but the goals were the same, to make everyone dependent on them at any cost. I would like to add that this HOA was very fond of money. They often forced people to make repairs, also that people would go to a hardware store owned by a friend of theirs who would pay them a percentage of what he earned. It's a pretty profitable business, don't you think? You just force people to make some repairs, and if they don't, they won't spend money in the right store, but they'll get a fine for some made-up reason like Interior violates the HOA's bylaws simply because you have, for example, the wrong color of door or some minimal scratches on the windowsill. Another friend of mine, for example, was fined by this HOA for putting a lock made of glossy material on his gate, and the HOA forbids the use of shiny materials in the interior. Is that okay? No, not at all. But let's get to the point. This old woman was restricted in every possible way to force her to join the HOA. She was forbidden to use some basic things that supposedly belong to the HOA. For example, as the most absurd thing I can say, she was forbidden to use the roads near her house because it's property of the HOA. Although these a-holes forbade her to use the lake and the pier, which is actually her private property, because it's all the property of the HOA, and these a-holes actually claim to own her entire property. Of course, the lake is not her property, but the pier is, and she and her husband, who unfortunately passed away, built it together and documented everything there so that there would be no problems later. She has papers stating that this pier is her private property, but the HOA actually just steals it and even blocks her access to the lake. Also, this stupid Karen from the HOA, who runs the HOA and does the most evil, started telling everyone, her kids and the kids of other HOA leaders, to have private parties on this pier. Of course, without asking for permission from this old lady. And according to the rules of our area, you can have a private pier on the water, but you can't block access to the water much, so, so they were easily able to get to this pier. Also, Karen herself, who was actually the president of the HOA, was personally at these parties several times. These people were just destroying, taking over everything they saw. Much of what the lady had left near the pier and on the adjacent land was just destroyed. But the worst was yet to even come. The HOA fined her for it. He, yes, the HOA fined this woman for throwing that party on her private land. Let me remind you, she's not a member of the HOA, and they weren't her parties. This was the moment when she realized that she would not be able to do without a lawsuit. She didn't have a lot of money, but she had a lot of friends who had agreed to help her, because she's the kind of person who always helps everyone as much as she can. She also knew some lawyers, a lot of lawyers. Her husband was a lawyer himself. Looking ahead, Karen and the HOA actually lost everything after the courts. Her husband even left her, and now she has to pay some fines, and she served something like six months in prison for all that. For the lady, all this has definitely reinforced the idea that HOAs are evil. And she wants to convey to people that even if you have the money for an HOA, Better to think about everything a thousand times and then decide whether to have any dealings with HOAs after something like that. The next story is, new employee was setting me up and asking for a raise for herself, and she ended up failing. Romeo is the head of the service desk, among other esoteric roles that I can't quite recall. 
Juliet is an average worker who is recruited in, gets promoted, and is nigh skillless. The boss guy is the boss of Romeo and I. He doesn't have a lot of technical knowledge, but he's pretty close to Romeo. Me equals I was in charge of a department of about 50 or so workers. Server, storage, network, and some other interesting stuff. Actually, Juliet had previously worked where I eventually began to work. I heard some terrible things about my colleague's behavior, including how she spent a ton of time and money and had no real IT skills. Fast forward more than 10 years. I'm in charge of a section of the IT division, and she's employed by Romeo, but at least she works for him in a different division. She doesn't have a lot on her plate, so she can devote a lot of time to creating the needed reports while making it appear as though she's an expert. She receives a lot of attention, and even the boss man compliments her. She now believes she's unstoppable and is free to act however she pleases. She begins to obstruct my department's IT projects. The fall starts now. Many of her coworkers claim that she acts like the boss and isn't doing her fair share of work. She delegates the work to someone else and then claims credit for it. And why don't they talk to Romeo, their boss? They made an effort, but he's a difficult man to approach. He insists on having his way, or he will not move an inch. And apparently, boss man believes that that is a terrific way to act. I make an effort to be optimistic towards her, because I'm curious. She consents to show me her IBM tools, BI duties. I'm not terribly pleased. She's taken nearly six months to complete a task that may have taken only a few weeks. I start to realize that requests from Romeo and Boss Man are the only ones that actually get fulfilled quickly. For them, everything else is put on hold. With a DB restore, her lack of abilities cost her two breakdowns, not to add a ton of other minor repairs that my techs need to make. Now that I've read the summary at a meeting I didn't attend, I can see that she holds my department responsible for her missed milestones. What the F? And when I confront her and question her, she tries to flee by claiming that I misquoted her. Romeo, who was present at the meeting, was asked about it when I did. He said that she's missing milestones because my techs are taking too long to do their task. Romeo, it should be noted, is a straight-placed individual. If everything isn't accounted for and requests aren't made properly, he will not do anything himself. Why doesn't that apply to her? I inquire. Because despite the fact that she didn't follow the correct procedures, we actually tried to get her running. Okay, I guess I'm starting to become irritated. She's irking my staff members and those in her own department by placing the blame for her mistakes on everyone else. She frequently arrives at work last and leaves first. After some time has passed, it becomes apparent that she's adept at explaining what she does and that there aren't actually that many talents required, despite the fact that this should be obvious. Then her being deserving of a promotion is decided by Romeo and the boss man. She receives the promotion instead of the man who has more experience and talents and who has done most of the work for her while she takes the credit. She now occasionally attends meetings that are held at my level, and she continues to berate everyone else with the exception of her boss and the department head. She exerts every effort to get them to dance to her music. And it also works. She may not be young, but she still has a pretty youthful appearance. Because that is the proper course of action, she schemes with her employer to implement certain adjustments. As soon as the department head and her supervisor start talking about this, additional new projects incorporating her depravity follow. Oh, I'm becoming angry now. Whenever they continue to create work involving redundant systems because they believe that's how everything should be, it involved an IBM IT system. It was only intended to be used for one thing, but somewhere along the line, before it was really purchased, a number of additional items were also purchased as a part of the package. It also came with a ton of outside assistance putting it up. My department shouldn't and wouldn't touch it because it was a system designed for their department. In my department, we already had a plan in place and deployed software from several vendors that was specifically significantly superior to the ones they began using. So why would you spend $200,000 on licensing and outside help only to get her a new toy? Suddenly, I was prohibited from rehiring one of my employees because 
Bossman believed a fresh recruit for the new product would bring more benefit. What? We already had too few people. Uh, additionally, they used my employee on a piece of software. I started preparing my retaliation. She simply never told me that asset management was one of her new instruments. She changed the setup. She made the external consultants do her bidding, and then she portrayed it as the coming of Jesus when it was finished. There were two attributes, one that requires manual data entry from everyone. It implied that everyone had to manually enter everything that was supplied by the corporation. For a phone, iPad, computer, monitor, etc., serial, kind, manufacturer, every employee had to now keep their own entries in the software with all of their equipment after a lengthy argument that I ultimately lost. I wanted the service desk to enter the data as soon as they got it and just prepare it. Just in case you were curious, that made way more sense to me and numerous others, but added additional tasks to the service desk. In order to create an asset inventory, she also needed to install a small client on each server in the business. I rejected it since we had already had one for monitoring and two others due to problems with obligatory compliance. There would have been no issue if she'd just spoken to me before spending $25,000 on setting it up and customizing it. Everyone in the room was informed that I will receive what she spent, $25,000, in three months creating later that day. And whenever I had the chance, I inquired about the status of her toy's implementation plan. She was struggling a lot and was really far behind. Every time she attended meetings, she provided updates with Feature X now operational. I already knew the response, but our current can already do that at this time, as well as X and Y. When is this going to be integrated into the new system? She was a little petty, but hey, she tried her best to irritate me in a lot of other ways. The company has numerous offices, right? And she works every day out of the one where I spend the most time. She decides one day that she is Romeo's trusty sidekick. She ought to have her own workplace. In her language, that entailed completely altering the seating arrangement for that office branch. Usually, it doesn't bother me too much if someone has to move to create room. She should have her own office now that she was promoted, of course. She just made plans with Romeo and then distributed who should relocate when in an effort to just upset everyone. In most cases, it was determined jointly and in person. Everyone was running to me anyway, moaning about how and where they were being placed, so I swiftly stopped it. I spoke with her and gave her a better way to accomplish it after explaining why the way she intended to do it wouldn't work, and she went about it by erecting multiple walls. I therefore made every effort to remain composed, professional, while informing her and Romeo that their plan made absolutely no sense and that we could instead carry it out on my own. Romeo headed straight for Bossman. Unfortunately, he was really irritated that we couldn't come to a consensus. Once more, I calmly explained to Juliet how we could accomplish the aim of an office without spending money on walls or wasting time moving people around. He completely agreed with me. So I scored another triumph with a headshot. Romeo was able to recognize that it actually made more sense. I regret doing that to Juliet because she ended up sobbing during the phone call. But once more, I presented her with a logical explanation of a point on which we disagreed and she was not satisfied. Now that she had been a complete B to them, everyone in the office started to despise her even more. There was zero assistance to her. She really put in more work because she had so many reports to produce. A step above Boss Guy, a new CEO is appointed. The new one was far superior to the old one. He had the same technical knowledge and was able to see reason. Poor Juliet, things only get worse from this point on. The business needed to make savings, otherwise there would be layoffs. Perfect. How about Juliet's software toy? It requires a lot of maintenance because no one in the department is qualified to do it. Consequently, it was very expensive every time something needed to be changed. I never intended to let some of the tech folks maintain it because it wasn't in my department and they had already had plenty to do. I therefore pointed out that we do have a number of software solutions that overlap. If necessary, we should streamline operations and reduce the costs. Fortunately, Bossman and Romeo concur that the toy solution is fantastic and think it's a brilliant idea. 
As a result, I organize my office and bring all of Romeo and Bossman's subpar software to the front. A cost comparison is done while also taking into account additional software. It's clear how much money went into her toy and that it still falls short of the open source solution that we're employing. Although the program is free, we do have to pay for new features to be approved and other things like that, as well as to have in-house personnel maintain it. Therefore, a lot of the extra software was eliminated, and almost all financing was taken from it, because the best software was almost free in comparison to the price of Juliet's toy, so that it could slowly perish in a corner. The next program she used frequently was her other one. I had used a number of different tools at a previous job that were way more effective, quicker, and able to perform more. We were able to get it for free. We would have had to pay for SA if we had begun using it by giving our vendor a little push when we renewed the license on some other software. The CEO and I had a brief, informal conversation in the hallway. We just got this wonderful software that's almost free. Why not use that instead of the other software and save a bunch of money? Okay, so there was a lot of prodding in the proper directions, but there was also a curveball tossed in. As a result, Juliet was left in charge of a system that had already begun its death spiral and had to become familiar with the new software. Although it shouldn't be too difficult, her technical skills aren't very strong. Did I mention that the boss man was preparing to retire and had been doing so for a few years and that he'd been preparing Juliet to take over for him? After all this, he actually came to the conclusion that she wasn't quite as good as he had believed. She started to suspect as much, and she therefore left and found work elsewhere, even before he retired. She did the same, according to what I was told by a former coworker who now works with her. She acted the same way and persuaded the people to get the same program. However, at least she wasn't there to irritate the other people. I personally hate people who are very arrogant and want everyone to just bow down to them fulfill their whims, but in fact, they are really nothing. Those kinds of people almost always turn out to be untalented and just putting on airs, not really proficient enough to be as good as what they want you to think they are. This story seems to portray a frustrating scenario in which Juliet, a worker with little IT skills, was able to advance to a position of influence thanks to Romeo, her employer, and her tight relationships with him. The guy, who seems to be a competent and experienced individual, had to endure the frustration of witnessing someone else, less skilled, receive praise and promotions. This imbalance in recognition and reward can be incredibly demoralizing for dedicated employees who genuinely contribute to the company's success. It seems to be a warning story about the repercussions of favoritism and the significance of elevating people based on performance and talent rather than their interpersonal ties. The story also emphasizes the significance of successful cooperation and communication. By learning from these experiences, companies can strive to create a more equitable and productive work environment for all their employees. The next story is, Bank wanted to cheat my dad out of a huge amount of money. You messed with the wrong old man. My father has never appreciated the fact that banks can legally rob individuals. Having to pay the bank what is practically the value of two houses and interest payments over two or three decades is just plain unfair, in his opinion, for folks like him who work the daily grind. He hopes to one day violate a bank's contract in the same way as they violate the rights of their clients. That's what he received, whether it was just dumb luck, or a decision made by God in response to his prayers to give him that kind of opportunity. My father obtained a loan from a tiny bank from the name of DCB Bank to finance the purchase of our family's first home. Everything was good until the 1997 financial crisis arrives a few years later. Numerous borrowers of home loans got acknowledgement documents from their new banks outlining the terms of their new home loan payment and policies as the smaller banks were acquired by the larger ones. For whatever reason, my father never got this. He was only aware that the RHB Bank Corporation had acquired his former bank and that he was now an unofficial client. God bless him, but my dad knew how to manage his money wisely. He was aware that he might avoid paying 30 years worth of interest installments if he had made a full settlement on his original loan. 
So he visited a local RHB bank branch at some point in 2007 to complete a full settlement, and this is what transpired. Employer of RHB I apologize, sir. You would still be required to make interest payments even if you reached a full settlement. Dad What do you mean? I have a house loan contract with DCB that specifies that I can pay off the entire loan amount without incurring any interest. Although you acknowledged and signed under RHB, I never got the acknowledgement papers. The DCB bank contract is the only document I have here. I never signed any documents from your bank. Sir, the number one Malaysia home loan. I know you have to provide letters of acknowledgement for the loan transfer. I need you, the RHB bank, to show proof that I have signed acknowledging RHB's new lending policy. My paper with DCB is still valid as of right now until you have my signature. The employer and her colleagues started searching through their databases and files for any acknowledgement from my dad regarding their loan deal, which takes them approximately an hour. The bank's manager had summoned my father to his office at this point to discuss the issue. In essence, it turned from a cordial agreement to a shouting match that could be heard in the nearby food stands. The end of the conversation was all that my father could still fully recall, and to his son, it was undoubtedly one heck of a kick a combo ender. However, he couldn't remember the majority of what was said. Manager, I'm sorry, Mr. Muhammad, but regardless of whether you reach a full settlement, you must still pay the interest. Okay, then I comprehend. I'll just have to bring this up with Bank Nagara, Malaysia's national bank. Let them assist you in locating my signature. The bank manager was now in my dad's hands. He excused himself to make a few phone calls to top management, which took around 30 minutes, rather than risking a possible million-dollar lawsuit and maybe losing his job. The manager approaches my dad after making the aforementioned phone calls and got him to accept the whole settlement without the additional interest payments. My dad asked him to get his housing allowance ready within the week, and they obliged, further adding salt to the wound. Overall, my dad was able to secure himself a home, the housing subsidy, and in the process screwed RHB Bank out of what they would have been in a retirement savings for a middle-class Malaysian in 2007. This is a fascinating, an amusing story that showcases the power of being financially literate and standing up for one's rights when dealing with financial institutions. Oh, it's so satisfying to see the bank finally agreeing to the full settlement without the additional interest installments. This story highlights the importance of knowing one's rights, contracts, and policies when dealing with financial matters, as it can lead to significant savings and pretty favorable outcomes, apparently. Overall, it's a well-told anecdote that entertains while conveying an important message about financial literacy and the need to be vigilant when dealing with banks and contracts. It's also a reminder of the power of standing up for oneself when faced with financial challenges. Thanks for watching. Just a reminder, subscribe, like, and comment.